Please remain standing for the reading from the Gospel. Listen to the good news of Christ, as proclaimed in the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 4, beginning at verse 14. Glory to Christ our Savior. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. And he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This is the gospel of Christ. Thank you. Please be seated. To our friends at home, good morning and God bless. Our readings for today. Where's the sermon? Reading for today, Psalm 19, then from the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 8, selected verses, verses 1 to 3, 5 to 6, and 8 to 10. From Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12, verse 12 to 31. And then the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 4, verse 14 to 21. I just thought I'd say this. I listen to the radio when I drive, and, and what I do, I listen to popular music, you know? And so you call in, and, and the DJ then says to you at the end of it, is there anybody that you would like to give a shout out to? You know, and this one lady called in, this was beautiful. She says, he said to anybody that you'd like to give a shout out to, she said, yes, I'd like to give a shout out to my January check. I miss it. <laughs> <laughs> Nehemiah is the governor in Jerusalem. He has been appointed by Cyrus, the king or the emperor of Persia. We will remember that the, the Jews were in exile in, in Babylon, Babylon conquered by the Persians, and then the emperor of, of Persia, Cyrus, said to Nehemiah and Ezra, the priest, you can take your people back to Jerusalem. That's in, in essence what he said. They returned and saw the devastation caused by the invasion of the Babylonian armies. And so the first task that Nehemiah and Ezra had was to rebuild the wall, which they did. In fact, the writing of Ezra and Nehemiah said they rebuilt the wall around Jerusalem within 52 days, because Nehemiah and Ezra gathered all the men and women and children to assist them in rebuilding the wall. Now in chapter 8, it comes the place where they need to rebuild their life as a nation, and as a community, and as individuals, as they stand before God to renew their covenant. I had a thought as I prepared this sermon, it would be wonderful for me just to demonstrate what happened if I could get you here at sunrise and then keep you until 12 o'clock. Because that's exactly what <laughs> Nehemiah and Ezra did. They read from the early hours of the morning until midday. They read the law, not only for people to hear, but for people to understand. And when they understood, was asked to make a response. 
And for me, that is the important thing. That relationship with God is not just about hearing what God has to say, but what is our response to it. When God is touching your life and is inspiring you to do something or to bring something new within the life of the community, or to do something with your own life, then you need a response to it, I think. It's not enough to hear. Simple example is in my own life, is, is, is when Aggie says, take out the dirt empty the bin and I say now she does that as particular when I watch port and my response is usually just now and now in South Africa that is a wonderful term just now I did not know that it affected life differently in other places because I remember a time I told you with Alan. You remember Alan Stanton? He came to the office to see me one day and I, he said, can I see you? I said, yes, just now. And uh, I came out of the office after about half an hour and, 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 and Alan was still standing outside the door. I said, why? What are you doing here? He said to me, you said you'll see me just now. I said, yes, just now, but not now. It's the response we get and that God requires. And I want to say this, just two things about that. The response that Jeremiah, that Nehemiah and Ezra requires of the people, they come as you listen when Les read, the people came mourning and weeping, aware of their own unworthiness, their faults and their sins. But Nehemiah's response is this, by saying, this is not a time to weep. This is a time to celebrate God's presence. And I think I have grown up in church with an idea that when I go to church that I should mourn and sit and weep because of my mistakes, forgetting that when I enter, it is grace that meets me. It is grace that receives me. It is grace that seeks to renew me. I only see now, hello, Ma. Isn't that Mrs. Prasango next to you, Prof? Hello, Mama, how are you? Hey? This mask, a terrible thing. You know, I was thinking the other day, now is a wonderful time to rob a bank because you can go into it with a mask and no one will know. <laughs> Wipe that, you know. The response that we make, I grew up deeply and constantly being made aware of my unworthiness to be before God. Nehemiah changed that image and that concept in my head and in my heart. Nehemiah reminds me what a privilege it is to be in God's presence. That God receives me in spite of what I've done and in spite of what I've been. That God embraces me with his love in spite of my brokenness and my own shortcomings. That God holds me and refuses to let me go. That is the truth that Nehemiah holds before the people of Jerusalem and Judah and Israel. He says, God is aware of your mistakes and your failures and the things that led you into exile. But now God is happy to receive you, to renew you and to restore you. So rejoice in God's presence. And so when we enter into the sanctuary, I want us to be mindful of the fact that none of us enter here perfect. None of us can claim 
that we deserve the right to be here. We don't. It is grace that invites us. It is grace that she receives us. It is love that embraces us. That makes us worthy to stand in God's presence. There's a beautiful chorus in with one voice that says, only by grace can we enter. And only by grace can we stand. And so we come, like Nehemiah and Ezra reminded the people, it is grace that has brought you thus far, and grace will lead you home. That's the truth. So when we enter, it's a time to rejoice and to celebrate. The Gospel of Luke is an amazing one. Uh, this portion of scripture is often read, often told. Uh, Dr. Mgorja used to call it Jesus' Magna Carta. His statement of purpose and his mission. In Matthew's gospel and in Mark's gospel, Jesus comes into Galilee and announces the presence of God's kingdom. In John's Gospel, he comes into Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John, and John says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In Luke's Gospel, he goes into the synagogue and announces the presence of the kingdom of God, not to the crowd, but to the religious leaders and the teachers of the law. And the purpose is for Jesus to enlist them in God's transforming love and God's renewing grace for the world and for the nation. And so when he reads the place where God begins to do God's work, that's why when we continue to read that portion, we will discover that the Teachers of the law and the Pharisees feel offended when Jesus says, and today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Today you've become part of it. But they are the custodians of the law. And their understanding of the law is that these people that Jesus seeks to include, these are the people that they need to keep out. As far as their understanding of the law was concerned, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees had to keep out the broken. The blind were not allowed into the synagogue or the temple. The prisoners had to be kept at a distance. The poor and the oppressed couldn't make the necessary offerings, so they were not allowed even within close proximity of the temple courts and the synagogues. And Jesus says, now is the time to let them in. And that offended them. And when Jesus begins to, his process and the pro proclamation of the presence of God's reign and God's kingdom in the world, I find it amazing that he begins to enlist people. In Matthew and Mark's gospel, he goes to the sea and he calls Andrew and Simon and James and John. In John's gospel, it is, he calls Andrew and Philip. Andrew finds Peter and Philip finds Nathaniel. And in John's Gospel, when they ask him about his mission, he says, come and see. And so there is always people that Jesus needs and that he enlists so that we, they become the agents of God's transforming love in the world. Now, I have news for all of us. The day he walked through the doors of that sanctuary 
and came to worship in this place and to serve God in this place without you knowing you have been enlisted. Without us knowing we have been enlisted, God refused to do this work without us even when he can do it without us. He makes us part of this renewal process that seeks to transform and bring new life and new moments into the world and into the community. So we have been called and been enlisted. I like that word, enlisted, you know? I didn't know that. It's like being born into a family. That's why I always greet you as God's family. To be born in the particular family that I was born into, we discovered certain things that some of it that we agreed with, other things we didn't agree with, you know? And I remember one day when I disagreed with my dad, he said to me, while you live in this house, you live by my rules, and when you have your own house, you can create your own rules. But here, you live by my rules. It was an interesting thing, you see. I started to work, let me tell you the story. I started to work, and because I was young, I bought, what was it called then, a hi-fi set. Do you remember the hi-fi set? Bought one. And down the road, one eve, one Saturday afternoon, my sister comes and says, we're going to have a party down at Bridget's house. Her family, her mom and dad has gone away for the weekend, and we will take over the house. But they need music. So I said, I've got a hi-fi set. Let's take it. Took it, and we had a party. Not knowing that when my dad came from work, he wanted to listen to the news. You see? So late uh, Saturday evening, I come home with my hi-fi, put it in its corner, and my father said, who gave you permission to take that thing out of this house? Me? Say, it's mine. Therefore, I took it. And my father said, whatever is in this house is mine. Doesn't matter who bought it. If it enters through that door, it's mine. Next time, when you want to take it, you ask me. That's the rule. Jesus changes the rules of the law. And the Pharisees doesn't like it. He says, no longer will the law hold people in captivity, but the law will transform, grace will come and transform the law so that those who are outside will be allowed in. No longer will people be governed by strict rules of the law and by religious observance. Now they will have the freedom to serve and worship God. Even those who are not allowed in will serve God where they are. Remember the conversation with Jesus at the woman in John chapter 4. She speaks of the temple. Jesus speaks of the temple, and she speaks of another place, and Jesus says there will be a time when they will worship where they are, as long as they worship in spirit and in truth. So grace sets us free from the bondage of the law and sin. And grace allows us the freedom, even with our weaknesses and our shortcomings, with our brokenness and our mistakes, grace allows us the freedom to enter into God's presence. And here we are free to celebrate and to take that which God has given us. The year of the Lord's favor is not just the jubilee I have discovered. 
The year of the Lord's favor is for all to participate in the abundance of God's love, God's mercy, and God's grace. Love that overflows and grace that has no end and mercy that's with us from the beginning of every day. The year of the Lord's favor is to remind us that we have the privilege to live and to share and to participate in the abundance of God's love and of God's grace. And this is the miracle. In spite of what I did that evening and how I confronted my father, he never disowned me as his son. In spite of my shortcomings and my faults and my weaknesses, God has never disowned me as his child. So grace calls me into this place every week. And grace allows me to stand. And when I stand, I know that my sins are forgiven and my guilt is washed away because that's what grace does. The law will tell me that I should wait outside. Grace, grace says, come in. The law will tell me that you're not fit <laughs> to enter. But grace will says, tells me that love has made me worthy. And that's what Jesus tries to convey to the Pharisees and the scribes of his day. The law can no longer keep out. This is what Jesus is trying to say to them. The law can no longer keep out those whom God and his love has allowed in. That's the wonder. And that's the miracle. The law can no longer keep out that which God in his love has allowed in. And Paul says to all of that, we have been enlisted as members of Christ's body. Not only to hear it, to participate in it, and to invite others to be part of it. So may God bless you. May God pour his spirit upon you abundantly and graciously. And may God's love surround you now and always. Amen. From our bulletin, just a sincere word of thanks to, to Munin for the flowers in memory of Lynn. And we celebrate his memory and we give thanks to Munin and her family. If you'd like to sponsor flowers, please add your name to the list in the vestibule. If there is an important milestone that you'd like to, to, to celebrate and you would like to honor that with a, with a gift of flowers to the church would be amazingly wonderful. The jumble shop opens from every Wednesday at 10, and then on the first Saturday of each month, beginning on the 5th of February at 9, the Jumble Shop will be open. We continue to remember, hold in our prayers, Marinda van Dijk, Jean Heron, Beryl Perro, and the members at Rosehaven and San Serino. Sensorino is wonderful. I went there again on, on Friday. I see Sensorino every third Friday of the month. I go there to visit them. And uh, I see Val Lord in particular. She's the one who started this. She's, about the, she's the only one that I know at Sensorino as, uh, as part of St. John's. But she has gathered a group of about 23 that comes on a fr third Friday of the month. Uh, for communion, and they are from every denomination. I, I don't ask anymore whether you are Methodist, Anglican, Presbyterian, or Congregationalist, or whether you ZCC. As long as you're there, wonderful. We have a wonderful time together. I'm just concerned about Val. Val is slowly 
weakening. He, he struggles to hear and begins to withdraw. The minute she's in a crowd, then I don't know what she says, she has some echoes then, can't hear well. But she's still in good health. I have, this is Val, I have no pain, Peter. I have no pain. I am wonderful. And, uh, and I thank you for coming. So she sends her love to St. John's and, and every member that remember Val Lord here today. Now, I don't know whether he's aware of it, but Julian, you have been volunteered. Yeah, to say something, please come. <laughs> We're sitting in the meeting on Wednesday afternoon, I'm sitting in a, in a conversation with his wife, Karen, and another lady, Ngobile, no, Ngobile. Uh, and, 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 and the garden asked, can someone say, can I say something about Alpha? I said, can you say something on Sunday about it? And she says, yes. I said, wonderful. She says, Julian will. <laughs> so, it's not my, it's not my, it's your wife. You can use this one so that the others can hear the recording. Thank you, Reverend Peter. Um, yeah, so we get volunteers to do the things. Um, what a wonderful introduction. The sermon today is, is probably the best way of introducing uh, what uh, I want to announce. Um, we want to uh, use St. John's premises to announce an alpha course and to start an alpha course. And today, um, the announcement is that Carl says, stick to the script. Uh, what is alpha? Who's invited? And where will it be? So I'll try to be as brief as possible in that. Alpha is a course, a course in basic Christianity. And it runs over about 10 weeks, and it will be held at St. John's. What we need from you is we need volunteers to come and assist us in hosting an Alpha course over the next few weeks. We'll start running it in mid-February, but we wanted to have a training session for those volunteers who want to come along and be part of the course on Saturday from 9 to about 12 o'clock at St. John's. The course is free. And the course is open to what I appreciated earlier. For those who we of privilege to say, come and see. It's for those who are looking for meaning in life. We're living in unprecedented times. People are struggling to come to grips um, with, with life issues. And here's a perfect opportunity for us to invite a neighbor, a colleague, a family member to say, come and see. The course will be held here. It will be yeah, midweek probably, but we'll make those arrangements. And it's free of charge, and it's, it's a no obligation conversation about certain topics that will be presented each week. The format of the course would be that we will present a meal so that there's a welcome, generous opportunity for people to feel at home here. We will then play a video on the topic for the evening. And the video topics would be Who is Jesus? Why must I read my Bible? Does God still heal today? And various other topics. The discussions that flow after the video is very important because we really just stand back and allow our guests to speak about their understanding of these topics we follow. And I can tell you in the time of social distancing and isolation in the way that we've kind of modeled our lives in the last two years, I believe people are looking for an opportunity to connect with one another in a wholesome way again. And so we want to invite you, your role is to pray for this course. To pray for people to be invited, to pray for God to allow hearts to be curious and excited about what they can be involved in, and to pray for those who come here to be transformed by God's Holy Spirit. So we're looking for prayer partners, we're looking for volunteers to come along and help us serve a meal, we're looking for people to come along and just sit among our guests and be available to be a friend to somebody who's currently reaching out to seek for purpose and meaning in life. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Let me just remind you of the most important part of Julian's uh, uh, notice. There will be a meal. So you can come straight from work. I can't, let me just emphasize that. Come straight from work. If you have it in the afternoon, late afternoon, come straight from work and you won't go home hungry. Ladies, that's the evening that you tell your hubby. There won't be any food tonight. Go to Alpha. And, and if there are gentlemen among you who 
that prepares a meal, net, that's the evening you tell Joy, go to Alpha. There's, but there's food there. But more than just physical sustenance, there will be sustenance for the soul. That's what I believe will happen. So God bless you. And, uh, and thank you, Julian, for volunteering. Let us now turn up our hearts to hear to God in prayer, and we begin by saying together the prayer for Africa, and then Les will lead us in our prayers for, of intercession. We say together, God bless Africa, guard our children, guide our leaders, and give us peace for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen.